Well, over the last few years, our society has really been challenged and shaken by, you know, one, COVID craziness, two, the device of woke victimization policies of racial and sexual identities. Oh, then three, we have the Ukraine-Russian war. And four, of course, we have the seemingly deliberate rush by this world's governments and central banks to destroy our economic and financial well-being by heaping up... You you know, mountains of debt and spending, you know, floods of cash to, to chase a decreasing amount of goods to make it, you know, our cost of living is rising, you know, and the, and the, the obscenely rich are getting richer and all the rest of us are getting poorer. I, you know, I know as well as anybody else, you know, you go to the supermarket, what it's like, you know, how much prices have gone up. You go to the gas pump, how much it costs to fill up a tank of gas. Well, in the context of all these events, there we have, you know, what comes to what comes into the current news cycle this past week, well, the Roe v. Wade abortion issue roared back into our consciousness. And the, you know, the, you know, remember the Roe v. Wade issue came about some 50 years ago when the activist Supreme Court the, there in the early 70s decided that, you know, there was a constitutional privacy right, 14th Amendment type, that they created that was never explicitly mentioned. And it just fueled the culture wars. It has been an ongoing feature of the culture wars for the last 50 years, really. But, you know, this past week, the timing of this unprecedented leak of Judge Alito's written legal opinion about abortion and whether it is in the Constitution, of course, his opinion, what he said at that point in time, you know, point saying it should just re be referred back to the states. It's not something the federal government should be involved in, which was an incredible betrayal an unprecedented betrayal of the court and the the legal system and you know all the stuff that has flowed from it and all the hate because there's been efforts to dox you know the conservative supreme court judges say oh here's their home address go you know go and violently or whatever protest make their life miserable to whatever degree you can you know all this happened when what is the time I mean, what's well, all leading up it happened just days before Mother's Day. You know, there's something more than a little ironic this year about this timing because, after all, abortion is the antithesis of motherhood, isn't it? You know, abortion is, you know, the issue, the, the, the concern of our society is more than just about whether a murder is being committed. Those who practice abortion, whether they consciously know it, promote it, you know, pr promote abortion, these people are striking at the, the core of a civilized society. They're striking at motherhood, which, you know, and they're striking at a, by undermining motherhood, they're undermining the traditional family, which is the foundation for any decent, sustainable government. Those who promote abortion, you know, are rejecting wholesale, what? God's first directive to women and those women's husbands after their creation. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27. I'm going to cite the New Century Version here. So God created human beings in his image. In the image of God, he created them. He created them male and female. You know, this is there's a lot to ponder here. This is a pretty deep uh, subject. You could think about this for some time of what it means. But then you see, have verse twenty eight, Genesis one, verse twenty eight. Then what? What's next? God blessed them and said, "Have many children and grow a number." <laughs> You know, the, the King James, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, you know, and manage it for me. <laughs> Abortion works contrary to that, totally. 
instead of having many children and grow in number, it's, it's what do we have? We have all over the Western world, here in Canada, in the United States, in, in places in Western Europe, it's even more than that. You have shrinking societies. People aren't getting married. You know, they're not having children. We have all this stuff going on. Why do you think we have some of our economic problems? We have be we're looking for all these, you know, people to fill jobs and we don't have them. And we have to import labor. Why do we do this? Because we're not having enough children to even replace and replenish our society. This is a, I mean, statistically, this is a real problem. And a lot of it is because of abortion. You consider, you add up all the numbers of children that weren't allowed to live and the children that they would have had <laughs> that weren't allowed to be and to exist. It's a tremendous thing. It's incredible. It's a real crime. Be fruitful and multiply. As I've said, abortion is dividing North American society and it's an issue of motherhood. There are really very different views. Right now, you know, in the United States, I think there are about 26 states, you know, the so-called red states, already have various laws in their books restricting abortion one way or another. You know, you have the so-called heartbeat laws. Once you have a heartbeat, you know, you, you have it, you know, that um, they, they don't allow it. They have all various, they, they vary according to whatever. But you know, all these laws, and I, I can appreciate what the, what the legislatures in these places are trying to do, okay? They're trying to deal with a very thorny social issue. But all these laws, state laws, whether we're talking about in the USA or, of course, in Canada, we don't have any laws. They just, they just said you can't make any laws against it. We don't have any sort of saying that you have to do this or whatever, uh, Canadians, you know, our politicians are wimps to begin with. They won't talk about anything that's really controversial. They don't want to really get into it. But, you know, when a state makes a law, it nevertheless, even whatever the intent of that law, a state or a government can never force any woman to be a good mother. And they can't force people to appreciate their mothers either. But you know, it's the duty of the church to teach people the way of the Lord, to teach righteousness and, and justice. <laughs> and this is based on the word of God. Let's go to, I want to show you something here, you know, what undergirds Mother's Day and why, why it is actually important and significant for those of us, you know, who do want to worship the true God. Let's go to Exodus chapter 20 and verse 12. I'm going to cite this in the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Exodus 20, verse 12. Hey, blow, you know, open up your Bibles. Take a look at this. It says, Honor your father and your mother, so that you may have a long life in the land and that the Lord, that the Lord your God is giving you. Berto Casuto, you know, who is a late professor at Hebrew University, in Hebrew, okay, he took a look at this and said, wow, you know, this commandment, he said, placed as it is, it is between the first four, which teach somebody who is going, wants to worship the true God. The first four teach you how to worship the true God. The last six, well, the last six are more on loving your neighbor. It is the fifth commandment, which is the hinge commandment. The linchpin, okay, connects the two. Honor your father and your mother. You know, the word honor here is in Strong's in Hebrew. It's uh, Strong's 3513. It's kabad, or they'll say kabed, you know. it's Hebrew was written, you know, with the consonants, not the vowels always. And sometimes scholars will look at it. Well, was it a kabad or was it a kabed? You know, they, and, and you don't really know at this point in time. I guess when Moses comes up, he'll teach us appropriate uh, uh, Hebrew pronunciation from this standpoint, and we'll get it right. All right? But anyways, it means, when it says honor in Hebrew, you know, the word comes from the root, according to the lexicon, to be heavy. 
<laughs> you know, honor your mother. Heavy your mother. Okay, I, this is interesting. Heavy your mother. But, it, you know, in a good sense, this means <coughs> heavy it means to be, <coughs> conveys a sense of numerous, abundant, rich, honorable, having abundance of good things to make weighty. In other words, important. It's significant. Honor your mother. Your mother is significant. She may be weighty or she may not be weighty, but in, in her your estimation for her, what she has to say should count for a lot and weigh a lot on your mind and what she has to say. Now, the backstory of Mother's Day here in, in North America, you know, a woman named Ann Jarvis got Mother's Day started in 1908. So it's just only, you know, over a bit over 100 years ago, 112 years ago. By 1914, she had made it an official, you know, it was adopted. All the politicians got on board, you know. Well, who's against mothers and babies, you know, at that point in time? So, you know, I mean, politicians, you know, the old kissing the babies on the campaign trail. Politicians were suckers for this. They got on board relatively quickly. In the U.S., it, it became a it became a holiday in the U.S. And, you know, Canada, as typical, you know, we follow the U.S. and are influenced heavily by the U.S. They originally it was Mother's Day with the apostrophe after the last S, meaning all... Mother's Day. But some wise guy in the either the forest or the chocolate tree business, you know, said, Oh, Mother's Day. Let's put it before honor your mother and you know, and honoring your mother may became a bouquet of flowers, you know, uh, a box of chocolates, or taking her out to a restaurant and all these other things, giving giving mom a call. Nevertheless, besides all the marketing and commercialized aspect, Mother's Day nevertheless has a is soundly based on the judeo christian ethic it is something as someone who is a bible you know who is esteems the bible and what the bible teaches is something we should take a, a look at and it's a in our society is sort of a remnant you know judeo ethic uh, judeo christian ethic that underlies our society, it's it's still there, even though, as we see with this whole thing with abortion debate, and I don't, many people don't realize it if they're there saying, no, oh, you know, we 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 want to have this and do all this. They don't realize it's, it's undermining motherhood. It's undermining the family. But anyways, let's take a look. I want to show you how it is soundly based. The whole idea of honoring your mother and the concept of motherhood is is highly honored. Let's go to Deuteronomy 5. And this is a restating of the Ten Commandments. Okay, Just before the children of Israel would go in to occupy and take possession of their, the land that God had promised to them and to their descendants, you know, he, he's going to reiterate what to, in Hebrew is known as the Ten Words. Ten, you know, it's, it's, it's the executive overview, if you want to say, of God's way of life. Of It summarizes the essence of what, you know, God's commandments, his statutes, and his judgments would all be based on. It's these, these major principles. And Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments, the legal decisions I'm going to be speaking to you, um, today in your hearing, so that you may learn them and observe them carefully. The Lord our God made a covenant with us at Horeb. So he made, we have this living relationship with our God. And these covenants, you know, a covenant they understood, it had expectations of behavior, of moral norms that were expected of the people, that God expected of them. And they had agreed to do this as a people. And God would bless them as they would do it, and then he would curse them as they don't do it. It's just like in our country right now, you know, we had, and our society was based on these things. Even Mother's Day is points to that. And we are blessed to the degree we follow these things and, and base our lives on these principles, and we're going to be and are being cursed when we do not follow them. Now God, Lord our God, made a covenant with us at Horeb. The Lord did not make this covenant with our fathers, but with us, all of us who are alive today. You may not have been standing there 
but you're the descendants of these people. And we are, if, we're, if you are a Christian and think of yourself as Christian, you are among those descendants. For if you are Christ, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise, see, of these people. Paul makes this point very clear in Galatians. He makes the point clear in Corinthians, where, he, where he's speaking to Gentile Greeks, said, you know, all our fathers passed under the cloud, you know, in this whole reference when he talks about, you know, the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, how they were thinking. They are grafted into the story. They become part of the biblical narrative. So the Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. The Lord did not make this covenant with our fathers, but with us, all of us who are here alive today. <laughs> See, there's no out. <laughs> you know, can't be a smart, you know, trying to be a little a lawyer, get off in the technicality. No, I wasn't there. I wasn't standing there, so I'm not obliged. You know, that's not, that wasn't the way it was. That's not the way it is. The Lord spoke to you face to face at the mountain in the midst of the fire. So this was so important that the creator of the universe, the word, came down, stood on the mountain, and spoke the words himself to make a point and an impression not upon a whole nation of people. And if you go to drop down here to verse 16, Deuteronomy 5, verse 16, it says, Honor, which is respect, obey, care for your father and your mother, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Why? so that your days on the earth may be prolonged and so that it may go well with you in the land which the Lord your God gives you. There is a blessing and it's proportional, it's in direct relationship to whether you do this or not. If you don't do it, you're not going to have the blessing that occurs. But if you do do it, there will be a blessing for you. So you have a, you know, you have self-interest, you know, there's a real God attached, to, you know, there's a real motivator to why you should pay attention to this. Now, further in the scriptures, when God started, you know, expanding this fifth commandment, this linchpin that connects the honor and worship that you all, that we are uh, believers supposed to give to God and then our duties and responsibilities to our neighbors. You know, we're supposed to love the Lord God with all our heart and soul and our neighbor as ourself. See, Jesus re-enunciated these principles in the Gospels very clearly. I mean, these, these are all obligations, obligations we need to follow even now. In Leviticus 19.3, there's a further definition or clarification of some of what this fifth commandment of honoring your mother, honoring your father means. It says, Leviticus 19.3, New Living Translation here, each of you must show great respect, the way the living puts it, great respect to your mother and father. They put mother first <laughs> in Leviticus. This is interesting. You must show great respect for your mother and father. You must always observe my Sabbath days of rest. I am the Lord your God. You know, hey, in one breath, <laughs> God is saying, you know, you must respect your mother and father. And by the way, you know, you, you've got to observe my Sabbath days of rest. He's putting it on the same level, you know, here. You know, he's, they're right next to each other. You know, in the inspired Hebrew text of Leviticus 19.3, mother comes first. <laughs> it's listed first. This, says, this, this text in Leviticus 19.3 also emphasizes the great respect to be shown to the mother. It is using a wording similar to that used in the fourth commandment when discussing the great respect we are to show by, which is oftentimes translated in English, remembering the Sabbath. Day. Interesting. Brown, Driver and Briggs, the uh, pretty famous commentary, been around a long time, says that this, quote, great respect is the Hebrew word uh, yare, Strong's 3372, and is used in this context of a parent means fear, reverence, honor, you know, Fear is, is great, you know, this great respect. 
I mean, it can go two different ways when you're a little kid. <laughs> your mom and your mama says, don't do that. You know, your little kid learns fear, you know, a little bit to transgress because mama knows the, the way to get uh, attention to some little brains is through the little bottom with the, with the hand, okay? Well, that may be controversial these days. Mamas have always known how to, how to get it, you know, the, you know the, 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 keep their young ones in fear for their own life, for their own safety these days. A child must learn to obey quickly, otherwise it will die. Run out the road, you're dead. It's that quick. So it means in the Hebrew, great respect, Yare, Strong's 3372, with the parent, fear, reverence, honor. Those are pretty high terms. Leviticus 29, another verse just in the next chapter in Leviticus, puts it this way, further adds to this definition and expansion of our understanding of the fifth commandment and our obligations under this. It says, if anyone curses his father or mother, I mean, that's obviously you're not showing great respect if you're cursing them, is it? If anyone curses, you know, using words, his mother or father, he must be put to death. He has cursed his father or mother. His blood is on his own hands. Exodus 21, 15, which were the instructions God gave directly to Moses. We call them statutes to further define the Ten Commandments. You see, God didn't leave it up to our own imagination of, of what you know, he meant by certain things. He elaborated, you see. There are a lot of people who don't get this, but that's, you know, you know that's a problem for them. But anyways, uh, Exodus 21, 15, uh, the expanded Bible version says, anyone who hits or strikes his father or his mother must be put to death. This, is, this was serious business. Transgressing the fifth commandment was serious business. As God explained, you know, and in God's mind, the seriousness as he, you know, that he put on this in Exodus 21, 15 that we just read, that there was a death penalty if you hit a, a parent. The seriousness of this in God's mind can be understood by seeing that he placed it, he sandwiched the, the statute right between when he talked about the requirement for the death penalty for somebody who committed premeditated murder and on the other hand, somebody who was a kidnapper kidnapping people. So it was important in God's mind. Because obviously, if you are showing this, you know, great respect to a parent, you probably are not going to be doing premeditated murder or kidnapping. If you've got a decent parent anyways. Now, Jesus himself cited Leviticus 29 in the Gospels. Did you know that? Let's go to Matthew chapter 15 and verse 1. Matthew 15 and verse 1. I'm going to cite this in the Holman Christian Standard Bibles. Open your Gospels up to Matthew 15 and verse 1. Then Pharisees and scribes came from Jerusalem to Jesus and asked, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They're, you know, they're not keeping the oral law. They're not listening to all these teachings, uh, you know, that our rabbis have been giving us, that we've been accumulating, whatever. For they don't wash their hands when they eat. Okay, even tells you which one they're all, or they were concerned about. And Jesus answered them, and why do you break God's commandment? Because of your tradition. Okay, there's something you're ignoring. You're focusing on the twigs, and you're not paying attention to the main branches. Yeah, why are you breaking tradition? You know, from, from this aspect, while Mother's Day is a tradition, I want to say it doesn't break any of God's laws. You know, it's 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 and actually it's honoring. It's it's making it so that God's law is made honorable. When we honor our, our mother, when we honor our father, we're doing what God would say was good. And besides, these things in our society are typically put on Sunday. So you can even take your parent to a, to a restaurant and it doesn't break the Sabbath day. There we go. How about that? So yeah, everyone can take mom out to lunch, you know, from that standpoint on a Sunday. Why not? For God said, going back to Matthew 15, for God said, honor your father and mother. Okay, he's quoting there the fifth commandment. Jesus is, and the one who speaks evil of father and mother must be put to death. And there he's quoting the Leviticus statute. Oh, isn't that wild? 
But you say, whoever tells his father or mother whatever benefit you might have received from me is a gift committed to the temple. I don't want to support you in your old age because you used to spank me <laughs> or you told me off or you didn't like my first girlfriend, whatever it might have been. <laughs> okay. He does not, so whatever he says, so whoever tells his mother, you know, I'm not going to help you anymore. He does not have to honor his father. In this way, you have revoked God's word because of your tradition. See, Jesus is saying, look, it doesn't matter. You can't come up with an out, a loophole. You are required to honor your father and mother. That means, in this case, Jesus is saying, take care of them. You can't just say, I'm going to spend the money on something else. And, you know, you, your religious system gives you a little out. You know, you pay a little money to the rabbi and whatever else, and you can do whatever you want. Verse 7, hypocrites, Isaiah prophesied correctly about you when he said, This people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They worship me in vain, teaching as doctrines the commandments, the commands of men. Of course, that's a major problem. <laughs> of much of Christianity is they substitute the commandments of men rather than listening to the commandments and statutes and ordinances of God that are written in the scriptures. In some ways it occurs to me, I guess it just popped into my head, but you know, the advocates of abortion, you know, are, are upset that the Supreme Court is saying, you know, that there are judges there, the top of the Supreme Court, Alito in this case, we know for sure, was saying, hey, you know, this isn't in the federal constitution. We, we're we not going to enshrine a right or that people can demand this, whatever else. You know, this this is the stuff, this is for the states to handle. It's not, it's not our business. It's not written in there. In the same way, you know, like so many religions, they, you know, they, they teach commandments of men as though they were commandments of God when they're not at all. You know, God's word is there. It's, it's there for us to read if we want to keep it. The fifth commandment is well, the one we're talking about right now, honoring your mother and your father. Of course, the importance of mothers and motherhood, you know, surprise, is given importance in the Gospels of the New Covenant Scriptures. And it should be for obvious reasons. Mothers are, you know, this is features very prominently. The whole story of, of mothers and motherhood is in critically important. Because you see, the Bible, if you, if you look through the Hebrew scriptures, you, you, you always find, you know, they, they, when they're talking about the kings of ancient Israel, the Bible has this way of, you know, this guy was a rotter. His mother was so-and-so. This guy was a good king. His mother was so-and-so. The Bible consistently does that for, all, for all these kings. Whether they were good or bad, you know, it names the mother. And it's naming the mother because, <laughs> why? Because of the influence the mother had on raising the child. That shaped the way the child was in his moral you know, being. Did it, was he going to keep the way of the Lord and do righteousness and justice, or was he not? A lot of it had a lot to do with the mother. It's greatly important. That's why when we go to Luke chapter 1 and verse 26, we have this account, beginning in the Gospel of Luke, features very prominently in the Gospel. There are lessons to be learned. God takes great care in who he picks as mothers for you know, servants, his servants that are going to have prominent jobs to accomplish in the realization of God's purpose of reestablishing the kingdom of God on earth and bringing salvation on all these good things. Very, very important. God was, you know, very careful who he selected, the women he selected. Luke 1, verse 26. In the month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, which was Podunksville, Appalachia. <laughs> you know, as far as the Jews living in Judea or in uh, Jerusalem would have said, you know, it was, you know, it was in a rural area, you know, not a lot of Nazareth didn't have a big status. To a virgin named Mary, that says something. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. And Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. 
Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Verse 30, don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her. You have found favor with God. That's interesting. See, God had been selecting. He'd gone through, you know, an app, as a, where a process of picking, okay, who's going to be on my short list? And Mary ended up at the top of the list. For you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. And Mary asked the angel, how can this happen? I am a virgin. Okay, I've got a technical problem here. <laughs> And the angel replied, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby will, uh, to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. And what's more, your Elizabeth, your relative Elizabeth, has become pregnant in her own old age. People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month. God knows gestation period pretty well, doesn't he? For the word of God will never fail, or there is nothing impossible with God. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. You know, that was, took a lot of guts. Here, Mary was going to become pregnant, and she wasn't married. You know, there, the, the, social, the social inconvenience would have been enormous in a first century, you know, society of, of Jews of that time. It would have been enormous. The stigma applied to Mary, the stigma to her family. You know, it would he follow Jesus even in his ministry when he was doing his ministry. It would be throwing up them. There were, you know, the Pharisees would say, "We're not the son of fornication." You know, we weren't born of fornication. So it sort of followed them around from that standpoint. But Mary was strong enough, had faith enough, didn't mind it was going to be inconvenient. She was, she was you know, she would have the child. And then the angel left her. And a few days later, Mary hurried to the hill country of Judea to the town where Zechariah lived, the husband of Elizabeth, her cousin. And she entered the house and greeted Elizabeth. At the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leaped within her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Ah, this is an unborn child. <laughs> God is dealing with unborn children. He has this great plan. <laughs> he, 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 you know, to abort them, would that have been a crime in God's eyes? Ask yourself this. I mean, they had ways of aborting kids back then. Most certainly, herbs and stuff, that was known. And Elizabeth gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you above all women, and your child is blessed. Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? Just think about all this information, spiritual, revealed to these women. <laughs> it's amazing. Long before anybody else. This is an amazing thought when you think about it. Verse 44, when I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Look at the consciousness, the, the response here, the, the unborn child. You are blessed because you believe the Lord would do what he said. And Mary responded, How my soul praises the Lord, how my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he took notice of his lowly servant girl, and from now on all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One is holy. He has done great things for me. He shows mercy from generation to generation to all who fear him. His mighty arm has done tremendous things. He has scattered the proud and haughty ones. He has brought down princes from their thrones and exalted the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away with empty hands. He has helped his servant Israel and remembered to be merciful. For he made this promise to our ancestors, to Abraham and his children forever. It's an amazing prophecy, amazing preaching that Mary and Elizabeth were both doing that Luke wrote up in the scriptures. Very interesting, isn't it? Let's go to Matthew 19, verse 16.
Jesus, in his teaching and during his ministry, said in Matthew 19, 16, And someone came to him and said, Teacher, what essentially good thing shall I do to obtain eternal life? And Jesus answered, Why are you asking me about what is essentially good? There is only one who is essentially good, but if you wish to enter into eternal life, promote emotion? No. <laughs> Keep the commandments. Verse 18. He said to Jesus, which commandments? And Jesus said, you shall not commit murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. And then he throws in verse 19, honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. That is, love here is agape, is unselfishly seeking the best for your neighbor. And of course, you know, you know, families, you know, are the closest of neighbors. Families are the closest of neighbors. Honor your father and mother. Keep the commandments. When he says keep the commandments, in the Greek it's uh, Tereo, Strong's 5083, properly maintain, preserve, spiritually guard, keep intact. Keep the commandments in honor. You know, keep this intact. Maintain it. Honor is, in, in here in the Greek, is Strong's 5091. It's, it's Tim Ao. Honor your father and mother. Value at a high price. Honor. It reflects personal esteem, preciousness. Attached to it by the beholder. Did Jesus honor his mother? Well, yes, he did. <laughs> um, you know, he made the very specific point in the miracle that took place of when he turned the water into wine. You know, I'll, I'll let you read that yourself. It's a relatively long passage. It's John 2 and verses 1 to 12. You know, Mary, you know, he's at this, he's at a wedding. And at wedding, what do people do? They like to drink wine because they're celebrating. And as Mary said, you know, this couple, they, they ran out of wine. They, they didn't have a big budget. So they ran out of wine and Mary comes up. I mean, she was there serving. I don't know, you know, exactly. They don't say exactly, but she's there. She's in a service capacity. And she, Jesus you know, came to the, to, to the, you know, to the wedding as well with his disciples. You know, they were all invited because weddings were big deals <laughs> from that standpoint. And she says to Jesus, they have no more wine. <laughs> and Jesus' response is, well, what do you want me to do about it? You know, what would you like me to do? <laughs> and then she says to the servants who were there, she says, she knows he's a problem solver. And she knows he's going to solve the problem. So she says, you know, she points out the problem. And Jesus knows it's his responsibility to solve the problem for his mom. So he does. And what does he do? They have in, in Second Temple uh, uh, Judaism of the time, you know, they, they, would, they had these big purification jars of stone. And before you'd go into a house and for a feast like this, you'd wash your hands and up to the elbows and whatever. It was, it, that's what they were for. And so Jesus told the servants, and he saw, he saw a couple of these big stone jars sitting there. And he said, well, fill it up with water. And it turned into wine. Not just any wine. It turned into really very good wine. <laughs> because in, and because when they presented it to the to the I guess the well the captain or the governor of the wedding the the, the maitre d or the um, uh, well anyways he was in, in charge of festivities of, of this sort of thing leading the the wedding making sure everything happens on time and calling the musicians now and let's dance and you know whatever it might have been okay the bride gets to kiss the groom you know this sort of thing. <clears throat> He, you know, they presented him with the wine, and he said, "Wow, you know, people, yeah, generally put out the good wine first, and after they've had a couple of glasses, you know, they don't know that the quality is going down. <laughs> they don't know, but you've saved," he said, "the good wine until now. See, because what Jesus did, he did well. He did it, and it was to honor his mother and to solve. He solved the problem." 
he maintained, you know, he, he, he personally highly esteemed his mother and, you know, made sure that it was taken care of, the problem. Yes, he did honor his mother, didn't he? And you see also that Jesus was sensitive to all women and mothers. You, the whole thing, let's go Matthew 8 and verse 14, Roman Christian Standard Bible. One of the miracles of healings Jesus did was Jesus went into Peter's, the, his disciple Peter's house, and he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. So he touched her hand and the fever left her. And what did she do? <laughs> she got up and began serving them. It was just an amazing thing when you think about it. She had the heart of a servant. She set a good example for Peter and for his family. And John, let's go to John 19. John 19, in the Gospel of John, Holman Christian Standard Bible, verse 25. even at the very end of his life, when he had been nailed to the stake. You know, they put the nails through the wrist bones here. Nailed him and his feet, you know, through the ankles. Pain, suffering, and all these things. And when he was crucified, you see, the Romans, the way the Roman law went, that... The, all this, not only was the person who was crucified that he ended up dying, but the family of the crucified man would lose all their material possessions. The state would confiscate them. So they were going to, so Jesus' mother and his brothers, everybody, they were going to be homeless. And you have John 19, verse 25. And standing by the cross, of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, wife, uh, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple he loved standing there, this is written by John, and of course, this is John was referring to himself. He said to his mother, woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. And <clears throat> he fulfilled, of course, for Jesus what he could not any longer do. He was going to honor his mother. <clears throat> so why are mothers so honored in, in God's eyes? Well, the best of mothers teach their children, <clears throat> of course, from their very youngest days, the way of the Lord by both word and example. And, you know, this is obviously what Mary did. Because if Jesus grew up, he never, he didn't, he never sinned. And so she was there from his earliest days teaching him the right way. Of course, I think back and hopefully you can too, about your own mother's example. I know it, you know, I, I know the story because my mother used to tell me how, how much she wanted me. Now, when my mother was carrying me when she was pregnant with me, she had an appendicitis. Now, this was in their early 50s. This is serious business. She had to have an operation. They cut her open to remove the, the appendix. And... You know, it, I was growing, <laughs> you know, and I, I was there, and she had to, both the doctor she had, uh, he was a Jewish doctor, she was in, in Long Island, in New York, and she was, um, you know, they had to be very, very careful with the anesthetic, and after the operation, the operation was a success, they managed not to lose me, they were very careful about that. But the problem was, is my mother's wound never healed because I was, you know how it is with a woman, you grow. And the, and, and the, you know, the incision that they had made could never heal because I kept reopening it all the time as I would grow. So she had to wear straps to keep me in her womb, <laughs> to, keep the, to keep the skin together. 
the, 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 the body, you know, the, the, the womb together. She saved me also, I was, my, my earliest memory that I have, I don't know, maybe I was three, was the house that my parents were renting. Um, it was a 200-year-old converted blacksmith shed. <laughs> and they had this enormous chimney fire that was getting ready to burn the whole place down. And I remember my mother just bundling me. My father wasn't there. I think he was away at work or whatever, bundled me under one arm and my brother under the other arm and raced across the village green to a house where she could deposit us uh, in safety and then try to get the house, the fire out, you know, rouse the... Uh, volunteer fire crew who are in the firehouse playing cards <laughs> and not answering the phone. When I, as I was growing up, my mother, of course, gave me an appreciation for family. She gave me a curiosity of the world around me and all the things that we reserve. We lived in the country. She showed me how to bear up adversity. She had a terrible car accident and later on uh, there was a divorce and she, I credit my mother for teaching me a sense of discipline. You know, parents discipline their children so they will learn to discipline themselves. It's a very important stage. You, you teach a child to discipline themselves. She did a good job for that. My mother used to make us, you know, it wasn't that she, you know, we, my brother and I would do things wrong. She, She'd make us think about it, what we were doing wrong, and so that we would correct ourselves. But there was a stage, of course, as young boys, you know, we didn't always listen to our mother. And when we transgressed whatever she had asked us to do, you know, she'd, she'd try to get us to think about it more because she had this little thing. She'd tell us to go out and cut our own switch, and it better be just the right size. And, of course, this gave a whole period of reflection. <laughs> we learned to self-discipline ourselves. She gave me a sense, of course, of being loved. She encouraged and appreciated my walk with God, you know, long before many other people, my family ever would. And she, you know, she gave me a sense about the most important lessons about what true success in life is. And, you know, the world thinks that, you know, success is what you can get for yourself, you know. He wins with the most big boy toys, wins. That's what the world thinks, but that's not what my mother thought. You know, the success that of what's really significant is how faithfully you love and the love you give and the love you receive. That's what really counts. There are many good examples of mothers in the Bible who are capable, strong, resilient people who use their talents to grow their families or their nation. You have Sarah, who was a full partner in, in Abraham's relationship with God. You have Rebecca, whose, whose intuition, you know, was a sense of she had twin boys, but who was going to be the best one to lead the family faithfully in the, relation, in, in the relationship with God and take care of everybody in the family? She picked Jacob, not Esau. Deborah, you know, the, the, the prophetess or lawgiver, De you know, the judge, Deborah, I should say, was a mother to a whole nation. And she talks, you know, as a mother in Israel to, to save her people from oppressive, you know, foreign ruler. You had Miriam, of course, you know, the, another woman, but she, she wasn't Moses' mother, but she was assigned by her mother to, to take care of Moses, to keep an eye on him, you know, because they were under this threat. The Egyptians wanted to kill all the male babies. It was a form of, of uh, ancient abortion. You throw them in the river you know, to the crocodiles. Miriam, of course, was set a good example. She was bold to, to follow and to do what her mother asked her to do. And, he, you know, and you can read the whole story about Miriam and Moses, Moses' mother. You have the story of Samuel's mother, Hannah, who, you know, through faith and patience, was able to conceive and give birth to a child. Then the whole story of Ruth, Someone whose selflessness and caring and diligently being, being honoring her mother-in-law turned out to be the way, the means of, you know, finding happiness also for herself and giving birth to an ancestor of King David and of Jesus Christ himself. And you even have the story of the Shulamite woman who, you know, in the scriptures of 
her, of generosity to those who were in God's service. In this case, is generosity to Elijah. And she, she gave of her time and possessions to help others. All these things the Bible has a lot to say about honoring your mother. Let's go to Ephesians 6, verse 1. We'll wrap this up here. Ephesians 6 and verse 1. The Apostle Paul had this to say to the church. The Amplified Bible. Ephesians 6 and verse 1. It said, children, obey your parents in the Lord. That is, accept their guidance and discipline as his representatives. For this is right, you know, because his, obedience teaches wisdom, and it does teach self-discipline. These are important scriptural qualities, godly qualities we all must develop. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother. This is that word, tomeo. Esteem them, assign you know, high value to them as precious, and be respectful of them. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. You know, it wasn't the only commandment with a promise by no means. You know, but it was his the first commandment that God made with a very distinct promise that if you do this, you will, you know, that it may be well with you and that you may have a long life on the earth. This passage in Ephesians 6 and verse 1, you know, is very interesting. You know, Jameson Fawcett and Brown commentary has a, has a note about this. It says, this verse itself, by itself, Ephesians 6, verses 1 to 3, proves that the law in the Old Testament, they say, and that's their term. I wouldn't use the Old Testament. I use New Covenant, Old Covenant, but or Hebrew Scriptures. This verse proves the law in the Old Testament is not abolished. It's not. Honor your father and mother. <laughs> Honor your father and mother, that it may be well with you, and that you may have a long life on the earth. So, brothers and sisters in, in Christ, let us honor our God this weekend by paying special attention and by highly honoring, uh, by highly honoring all the mothers who are in our life. Till next week.